This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Salvaggi. Welcome to Hubwonk, a podcast of Pioneer Institute, a think tank in Boston. Americans are frequently asked to select a race or ethnicity when applying for jobs, answering the census, or applying to college. Yet few understand the origins of how those classifications evolved and were coded into practice. Owing to a shameful history of use to justify chattel slavery or exclude certain groups from immigration or citizenship, policymakers of the past half century have used the labels Black, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, and white primarily to measure the efficacy of civil rights laws and to track the success of economic inclusion programs. But even modern concepts of race still largely depend on legacy definitions and admittedly lack a reliable sociological or scientific foundation and rely on individuals to self-identify their race, all whilst Americans become increasingly multiracial. What can the story of how the concept of race and ethnicity took shape in the past tell us about how they might be better understood in the present? My guest today is George Mason law professor David Bernstein, whose newly released book entitled Classified, The Untold Story of Racial Classifications in America, delves into the history of how the concept of race so central to many of the political, cultural, and legal debates of our time, took shape. Professor Bernstein will share how racial classifications evolved from an invidious pretext for enslavement or exclusion to legal criteria used for enforcing civil rights laws to the modern practice of using such labels for the purpose of ensuring equal opportunity and improved diversity. He will also discuss the pitfalls of blurring and broadening the definition of race and ethnicity, in a way that serves to dilute the ability of policymakers to address valid claims of discrimination and past injustice. When I return, I'll be joined by author and George Mason law professor, David Bernstein. Okay, we're back. This is Hubwonk. I'm Joe Salvaggi, and I'm now pleased to be joined by George Mason law professor and author of the recently released book, Classified, The Untold Story of Racial Classification in America, David Bernstein. Welcome to Hubwonk, David. Thank you very much, Joe. All right, before we dive into the observations of your book, I want to um, frame our conversation by noting you are a law professor, um, and so we're going to be talking a lot about the way the law addresses the issue of race, but I'm curious. I know you've done a great deal of work. I've, I've started to dive into your earlier uh, uh, work and your uh, law review articles. What brought you as a, uh, as a scholar towards this intersection where uh, the concept of race is instantiated in law? What, what brought you to this place? I think it's clear that race uh, plays a significant role in American history and American legal history, but the vast majority of those who've written about it, who've investigated it historically, talk about it presently, are people who aren't sympathetic to and don't really understand markets, don't like limited government, uh, believe in racial essentialism, even though they deny it. And I thought it was important that someone approach these topics uh, with the, the same topics, but with a little bit different perspective. In, indeed. Um, so you, you do talk in your book a great deal about racial uh, classifications, but you also say it's an untold story. Uh, so whether regardless of which perspective is being uh, used, uh, not many people have delved into how we arrived here in the present day, which, which uh, we do uh, throw on terms like uh, race uh, uh, quite casually. Um, but it, uh, I think your background is in, in history, your uh, undergrad in history. Um, you've uh, delved in your book a lot into how we got uh, where we are. So what was the first sort of concept of race in the U.S.? Uh, how did, who, who started to define it and for what purpose? Well, I think officially the United States government had uh, race from the very first census. And it's a very interesting phenomenon that people associate slavery with race, but it's really more like race with slavery. So you had this country founded on liberal individualist principles and they had people enslaved. So they had to say, well, why is it okay to enslave these people? And it's oh, because they're a different race. So that's where we really got our American concept of race from their people who could be treated differently, have different rights than everybody else. But it wasn't in at the national level as opposed to the South where they had slavery and Jim Crow. Other than immigration law, the only play, only time that the United States really set out to officially define race was starting in the 1950s uh, with civil rights legislation. If you're going to protect people from racial discrimination, you have to decide which kinds of people you're trying to protect and how you're trying to count them to ensure they're being included. Okay, so uh, that's an interesting idea. I think I've read uh, before that, in, in fact, uh, uh, slavery came first and we had to invent some sort of excuse for slavery. Uh, so we created this concept of race. 
Um, that's, I think, uh, something uh, to, 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 to ponder. So who was it that in the 50s decided then, okay, we need to roll up our sleeves and uh, ensure we don't discriminate against groups? Who defined, uh, you know, who, who's which group and uh, the, the boundaries of those groups? So at the time, there was an obscure office called the Office of Federal Contract Compliance, which had to enforce executive orders from President Eisenhower requiring that federal contractors not discriminate. The problem, of course, is anyone could say they're not discriminating, but they wanted to sort of check up on the companies. So they started sending out surveys. How many individuals of these different groups do you have? And it was sort of not clear who exactly they were going to enumerate, Jews, Catholics, Blacks, uh, Mexicans. And eventually partly for ideological reasons, but largely uh, because of happenstance, they focused on visible racial minority groups. And the reason was at the time, it was considered at best rude and at worst illegal in many states to ask people their religious, ethnic, racial background. So how did they decide who is what race? It was really just the HR person looking around the room and saying, how many Black people we have? If you're Catholic, no one knows. If you're Jewish, no one knows. If you're Polish, no one knows just by looking at you. But we could pretty much tell who looks Black, so at least some people who look Mexican. So that's why civil rights laws and their uh, implementation, just sort of because of that, while they're being focused on race to the exclusion of other possible categories. So that seems like a pretty uh, uh, weak leg to, leg to stand on. Uh, you look around the room and decide who's uh, which race and, uh, and check off the boxes on behalf of the, the, the census. Your book goes into great detail. Uh, you talk about this. Um, I believe it was uh, uh, further down the line uh, instantiated in a, a term called budget statistical directive number 15, which actually really more formally codified these issues. But going into those categories of who is... Um, um, a black, uh, you know, in the various races, um, what what did we arrive at ultimately when we when we started in the fifties and we ended? And I don't want to uh, steal your thunder of talking about this uh, Directive Fifteen. Where did we wind up ultimately developing these categories? So one advantage of actually looking visibly at people is at least you could say, well, these are people who may actually suffer race discrimination because they look different. But by the 70s, we moved to a system of self-identification. And the problem that the federal government faced is that when people could identify themselves as whatever classification they want to, uh, different federal agencies were giving people different guidance as to which group they might belong to. So some federal agencies were looking at Spanish surnames for what we now call Hispanic, some at Spanish language households, some would just look and ask if you were Mexican, and so forth. And they were finding uh, in the federal government, they were getting data from different sources. They wanted to compare, but they couldn't compare it because the different groups were defined in all sorts of ways by different agencies. So they said, okay, let's get together and come up with a singular definition of different groups that will be applied across the board. And they basically took this idea of the visible minorities and said, okay, we'll have Black African American, we'll have uh, some sort of Spanish language category, they settled on Hispanic as an ethnic category because they wound up including white people from Spain and from South America, uh, a, a Asian American Pacific Islander, uh, white, which is basically just everybody else, uh, and uh, African American and black. Uh, as, a, as another category. So um, we wound up with these sort of five racial categories that coincidentally are not matched the longstanding racist classifications that have been used in other contexts. So again, we've got these now, I think it's five dis discrete categories. We've got um, you know, black, uh, Hispanic based on some sort of uh, cultural connection to Spain, sweeping uh, geographical location from uh, Afghanistan to, I guess, Japan, I don't know, um, and um, uh, and white being everybody else, or in indigenous people being um, uh, Native Americans in, the, in North America, but white people being everyone else, which seems to me to be, you mentioned uh, Italians and Jews and Poles and, you know, uh, North Africans and um, uh, Arabs, uh, you know, are these racial categories in any way coherent? Do they do they coalesce around any uh, consistent uh, uh, criteria? Look, in fairness, back in the 1970s, America was over 80% white, over 10% black, and what we now call Hispanics were largely put into the white 
classification. And then you had uh, a very small percentage, less than 1% Asian American and Native American. And at the time, people just thought, well, everyone kind of knows culturally who's white and who's black. Uh, and we have sort of a one drop rule. If you look at all like you're of African descent, you're black. If you don't, you're white. Uh, so at the time, it sort of made sense not to worry so much about the other classifications, but they really weren't anticipating that we'd first of all make Hispanic eventually into this entirely qu separate quasi-racial classification, and it would become a extremely diverse instead of being 80 plus percent mexican-american we now have people from all over latin america and of course the asian classification they just didn't think they had enough asians to bother breaking it down but they wound up with a sort of insane category that includes everyone like you said from uh pakistan not just to japan all the way to the philippines it includes people different who look different who have different religions different cultures who are if you believe even in the old race categories uh filipinos are mostly austronesians east asians uh, like Chinese are a different group, and then uh, Indians and other South Asians, Pakistanis are Caucasians. They're not even racially the same uh, group, and the different classifications are defined, as you mentioned, differently. So yeah, there's really no coherence to it. It was just sort of really slapdash, let's come up with classifications. And frankly, for the purposes that, that they were primarily made for, which was enforcing anti-discrimination laws, they weren't completely absurd. They weren't great. But as they expanded to other realms, they became increasingly dubious. Well, it, it seems to me, again, as, as you say, it came out of some sort of uh, administrative office and though well-intentioned, um, perhaps not based on any sort of scientific or, or rational basis. Um, but as they were handed down into the uh, uh, into the country and um, the country began to change. Uh, your book goes into great detail about the way in which um, political coalitions uh, formed around these groups and then enforced their boundaries. In some cases, they were trying to include more people in their uh, you know, protected group. In other cases, they were trying to exclude uh, groups that might logically qualify to be included. So say a little bit more about how uh, coalitions enforce the boundaries of these, uh, these race categories. Sure. So there was a question, should... Hispanic or something like that uh, could have been indigenous, mestizos, whatever. Uh, that would have been more of a racial category. Should that be a racial classification or should it be an ethnic classification, which it is now asked about separately? And African American groups and Asian groups both opposed making it to a racial classification yeah. because the Asian groups were afraid that Filipinos, who often have some Spanish descent, Spanish surnames, would check off uh, Hispanic rather than check off Asian, and similarly, African Americans were afraid that Afro Latinos would check off Latino or Hispanic rather than African American and reduce their numbers. Uh, Native American groups, meanwhile, did not want Hispanics to be uh, part of the Indian classification, even if they were 100% of indigenous origin, because they didn't want to share the Bureau of Indian Affairs resources with immigrants as opposed to uh, Native American tribes of North America. So they're also, and all the groups opposed in the 1990s, the movement to create a multiracial classification, because again, they want their numbers to be greater both for political lobbying purposes, but also if you engage in any kind of litigation over employment discrimination or voting rights, the baseline that you're trying to prove discrimination is how many people fit the classification uh, in the census in the local area. And the fewer people check that box, the harder it is to win lawsuits. Uh, so the plot thickens. Now, um, given that uh, we live in this melting pot called the U.S., um, and it's very possible, in fact, likely that many people have uh, black, white, Asian, American Indian, and Hispanic parents or grandparents. How should a multiracial person be classified? Just you know, there's all these kinds of groups trying to define boundaries. <clears throat> what about those people who uh, can check all boxes? Who, who's what? Who's who's white? Who's black? And who's Hispanic? And that uh, until you know. 1997, you were only allowed to check one box. As a compromise with the multiracial movement, they change it. Now you could check more than one box, although. After they implemented that and the agitation for multiracial classification died down, many federal agencies made internal rules saying basically if you're black and anything else, you're black. If you're white and anything else, you're the non-white classification. So they didn't in practice use uh, the multiracial classification uh, or the more than one classification. I think you should be allowed, I mean, ideally uh, for most of these purposes, you should just be allowed to say, how do you, there should really be two questions that are salient for the government, if any, one of which is, how do you identify? And the second would be, what do other people think of you as? Uh, and that would get a lot better data uh, for 
real sociological, anthropological, even civil rights purposes, and simply asking which of these very broad categories uh, do you identify with? Is it is so? You know, I don't want to oversimplify now, but um, given that we've got sort of this concept of a minority status and a special status, uh, in, again, instantiated in law or in anti discrimination, uh, what's the boundary between being a white person or white and uh, being a minority? Is is there a clear one? The boundary really is that if you're from anywhere in Europe or the Middle East up to Afghanistan, uh, other than Spain, and you're not from Latin America then you're not a minority. So uh, it doesn't really, it doesn't matter what your religion is or even how uh, dark complexioned you are. So a Yemeni Muslim is officially white, a dark complexioned Armenian whose pa grandparents were massacred by the Turks in 1918 are white and they're just white in exactly the same way, legally speaking, as a uh, white haired blonde uh, or blonde uh, blue eyed Icelander. So given how vague the term even, well, particularly, maybe especially white is, um, uh, when we're doing uh, sociological studies or uh, medical studies, how do we meaningfully, you know, when we go in and check off that box white, as you say, white can be a whole range of, of uh, backgrounds. What, uh, how can we meaningfully uh, tease out any sort of group preference or, or, or group oppression, if, that, if you will, uh, if if these these terms are so vague, well, let me take those two separately. Uh, first, with sociology or anthropological studies, a really bad result of the government creating these classifications and using them not just for statistical purposes for civil rights, but also in the census, is that there's huge databases that the government collects every 10 years when they do this survey that like one out of every eight Americans is asked to fill out, and they use these very crude classifications. Now, if you're a sociology professor or a grad student or anthropology student or economist or anybody else, you want to study groups, you could create your own data set, but it would cost a fortune uh, and very difficult to do, or you could just rely on the government data. So we wound up with the data that we are all given uh, about these issues being broken down by these crude classifications, and it winds up um, obscuring uh, in intragroup differences. So for example, when Lyndon Johnson back in the early 60s was promoting the war on poverty and JFK before him, the group that got the most attention at the time were Appalachian whites. Uh, and you have all these books with pictures of people living in these shacks with outhouses. And Appalachian whites are still among the worst off groups in the United States. And they've attracted a little bit of attention now because of the opioid crisis and whatnot. But in general, their data is just subsumed into whites and so no one pays uh, any attention to them. Contrary wise, for example, with Asian Americans, everyone says, well, they're the model minority are doing so well. But if you look in college admissions, for example, it's really people from uh, with origins in India and China and a couple of other countries in East Asia that are doing so well, but Pakistanis and Bangladeshis and Malaysians and a whole bunch of other uh, subgroups are actually average or worse, and we don't even think about that because they're all subsumed into Asian. Now, medical research is, a, is the really crazy one because the government mandated, Congress mandated that the FDA and NIH require uh, regulated industries to use racial classification to make sure groups aren't being left out. But instead of trying to figure out which groups to use in some sort of scientific uh, or anthropological, so I think you know, get experts together, say, hey, what would make sense for scientific studies? To avoid the obvious controversy that would cause, they just use the same crude studies, even though, by the way, the same crude categories, even though when this statistical directive number 15 was created, the government said very explicitly, so not meant to be scientific, but we've had a situation where, for example, Moderna's vaccine was delayed because they didn't have enough Hispanics in their study, even though there's really hard to see why Hispanics who could come from anywhere in the world would have any specific reaction to the vaccine other than rather than like Americans in general. So it's a case of garbage in, garbage out, where science is relying on highly unscientific foundations for its, for its analysis. Um, we, in earlier podcasts, we've talked about things like um, uh, crime statistics, uh, uh, such as the unfortunate uh, hate crimes against uh, Jews or Blacks or any kind of categories. They seem to be more precise in their analysis of, of racial categories. Are there parts of the government that sort of take make the extra step and actually uh, uh, you know, define people with a little more precision than, than uh, Directive 15? 
I'm really glad you mentioned the hate crimes example because it's something I thought of after I wrote Classify, after the book came out, as an example of where the government doesn't just accept the crude classifications and stop there. It looks at Catholics and Jews and Christians in general, all crimes against the old, crimes, you know, every possible hate crime, which makes a lot of sense if you're looking at hate crimes. And I think it goes to the point that it's not that classifications are never useful because you're silly to say oh we're not going to have hate we're not going to look at hate crimes because we want to classify people but that when you do classify when you need to you should be doing it in a precision way focused on what you're trying to get at and not just use these crude classifications unfortunately other than the hate crimes example even, even months after classify came out i haven't really come across any other example of the government uh using more of a of a precision uh, way of classifying people rather than just using these crude Directive 15 classifications. So, so all all this conversation about how vague these these uh, racial categories are are, are they're beyond academic or a passive uh, an analysis. Um, they really do also speak to uh, a lot of the government set asides for for um, let's say disadvantaged groups. However vague that term is is defined. What is the origin and where where does this concept of of the defining first defining race and then designating special set-asides for those race. Where, where did that begin? It really began after the Detroit riots in 1968 and other riots after MLK's assassination. The Kerner Commission, appointed by uh, the president, issued this report and said that there's despair and uh, lack of hope in Black communities and urban communities, and we need to do something to bring uh, African Americans more to the economic mainstream. And for the first decade or so, these programs that started off at the Small Business Administration, Department of Housing and Urban Development, and so forth, uh, were really geared specifically towards African Americans. They were officially open to other minorities, but the appointed officials were all uh, running them were all African American. They were known to be sort of African American programs. But as the formal rules got created, uh, they added like everyone who was not legally white, uh, essentially, non-Hispanic white, uh, was included, which again, at the time, was not that many people uh, because the country was overwhelmingly white and black. But we've gotten to a point now where most people who are eligible for government set aside or contracting preferences, unlike in the admissions context with universities where African-Americans get the highest preference, you get exactly the same preference if you are a Pakistani or Mexican immigrant who came here six years ago, got citizenship, you have a wealthy family, you start a business, you apply for an SBA loan or a special department of housing and urban development program, as you do if you're the descendant of slaves. It's already the case that, so most of the people who are eligible for these contracts are not African-Americans. African-Americans only get a small percentage of them and over 50% of Americans are eligible as members of minority groups. Another very large percentage are eligible as women. Uh, and of course, there's overlap. So we're already at a point where it's something like 70% of Americans are eligible for preferences at some point if everyone's getting a preference and no one's getting a preference. So while I'm not a huge fan of these preference programs to begin with, if I were a fan of them, I'd be concerned because if I really do think there are some groups that need these programs to be brought to the mainstream, it's not happening anymore. Well, I enjoy some uh, one of the funnier parts of your book. I want to bring in Boston a little bit here. Is as soon as you start to um, allow uh, broaden the range of people who can uh, uh, be eligible for preferences, uh, there's going to be people who claim uh, eligibility for preferences uh, with, let's say, somewhat dubious claims. Uh, you mentioned uh, some firefighters in Boston. I think even some teachers in Boston. Uh, I'm not surprised that the abuse sort of happened here. Uh, you, I think you may have mentioned more in your um, well, no, you, in, in your book you talk about. Uh, uh, two, um, it sounded like Irish sounded name, uh, uh, Boston firefighters who, who claimed uh, minority status. Say, say more about these kinds of abuses of, of, of uh, minority claims. Sure. Uh, look, uh, there's two different groups. There are people who fraud, who really fraudulently claim minority uh, heritage. And that include these two Irish firefighters who uh, Boston had a settlement, an affirmative action settlement because of past discrimination. They were giving preference to African-Americans. They failed the test the first time. They checked off African-American the second time and they got the jobs. And 10 years later, when they applied for promotion, they put down black again and their supervisor said, wait, you guys aren't black, you're Irish. And uh, they were Fire. They went through a civil service hearing and eventually it was determined that they didn't have any black heritage, that no one else thought of them as black, they didn't hold themselves out as black, so legally they cannot claim black status. So those are that's a relatively clear thing. The less clear examples, and it's not really clear whether this is even abuse, are people who have vague 
distant minority ancestry, but arguably, or maybe not even arguably, nevertheless come within the official definition of the category. So uh, Black African-American is defined as someone who has ancestry in one of the Black races of Africa. Uh, just reading that literally, if you do genealogical research and you discover that your great, 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 great grandfather was a, an escaped slave who came to the North, passed as white, uh, and then his descendants thereafter were white and everyone's lived their life as a white for 150 years, you still do have origins in one of the black races of Africa. If you're Hispanic, it says, if you, for Hispanic, it says you have to be someone who is, uh, is of Spanish cultural origin. A Spanish origin is a case in classified in my book that I sort of start off with with a guy who said i'm a sephardic jew my ancestors came from we kicked out of spain 500 years ago uh, but i'm spanish origin and the courts say well you don't you we don't require you speak spanish you don't be, or look hispanic whatever that might mean we don't require you have a spanish surname it says hispanic origin you're of a uh, spanish origin you're of spanish origin you're hispanic uh is that some abusing the system for affirmative action maybe but it's abusing it by the open invitation of how the classifications themselves are defined so I think in that in your book that that guy did get uh, his uh, Hispanic designation. So he fought and won, uh, even though his claim dates back to I guess 1492 or something like that. Um, now when we talk about uh, setting aside, um, uh, let's say money for uh, minority-owned businesses, um, how is it determined? Again, we're, we're we're having an argument on how an individual is, is determined to be a minority or a, a particular race. Um, your book doesn't go into great detail. But um, if I say I, I want to ensure that uh, I have a certain number of contracts set aside for minority-run businesses, what defines a minority-run? Just uh, you know, president or ownership, or how, how is that run? It's supposed to be fifty-one percent uh, minority-owned, which, as you might expect, leads to some abuses where you have people who are allegedly running the company or just being paid to put their uh, name on the title. But other than that, assuming that you have a legitimate claim to minority status, and again, this legitimate claim could be distant ancestry, uh, you basically write into the certifying agency. Usually it's a state agency, could be the federal government, and you, and you check off that you're a member of this group and you sign affidavit saying, I am a member of this group. And usually that's the end of that. But every once in a while, there is a certifying official who for whatever reason uh, doesn't believe your claim. In some states, they even ask you for a picture. So sometimes it's just, well, you don't look like you're black, but you wrote down black. So, And then they ask you to prove it. Uh, and exactly how you're supposed to prove it uh, is not 100%. Uh, clear. There are some guidelines in the federal government saying, well, you could look for membership in minority groups. You could look for how the person holds themselves out in the community. But you do, in a sense, wind up with many race trials. And it's not really clear whether those specific rules apply or whether ultimately, and there's a really mixed views on this in the agencies and the courts, is it really, do you really have to prove that you are Hispanic in some outward way that you participate in Hispanic culture or you speak Spanish, or is it enough to look back to the actual wording of the rule, which says you just have to be of Hispanic origin. And once you prove you have a Spanish ancestor, that's enough. It's it's interesting to me. Um, again, these, these policies are, are well-intentioned, um, but you point out, I mean, you and I just discussed people who may fraudulently assert that they are uh, uh, Hispanic, for instance. But you also mentioned that, of course, if you uh, immigrated here from Spain, you are uh, European, uh, you are comfortably an un un uncontested member of the Hispanic group, as opposed to uh, someone similarly uh, darker complected, like an Italian person who is also a European, but has no claim whatsoever. Um, you know, it, 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 you mentioned in, in um, DC, uh, the fact that uh, these set aside, these carve outs for minority owned business in DC, 80% were going to Hispanic um, uh, companies, 20%, you know, to black run companies. Say more about how, you know, sort of these, these set asides wind up uh, going to the wrong place. In fact, people who have recently immigrated or even uh, people of African American African American descent who are you know have no connection whatsoever to um, let's say former slaves they may have recently immigrated here from Africa or the Caribbean or or somewhere else. So let's start with the fact that the Hispanic classification for the federal government excludes Portuguese people, includes Spanish, excludes Portuguese and Brazilians, mm -hmm. uh, but does include people from Spain. And this is the product of when they created these Directive 15 classifications. They did it in this. 
as I mentioned, very haphazard way to just ask three Hispanic employees of the government to sort of get together, volunteers, uh, one from each of the major groups, Cuban, uh, Mexican, and Puerto Rican, said, come up with something. And one of them was very insistent that go back to Spain, that be Hispanic, and that's why Spain was included. But in D.C., uh, the local rules included Portuguese, and as of 1990, 80% of D.C. contracts that were set aside for minority businesses, which were really meant, again, to integrate African Americans into the economy, were going to three co to companies controlled by three Portuguese immigrant brothers. Uh, Massachusetts is another state as a large Portuguese minority uh, who faced discrimination historically, and Massachusetts doesn't consider them Hispanic, but has a separate uh, Portuguese classification under minorities. So basically, when it comes to these contracts or affirmative action or anything else, uh, <laughs> we have no norm as a, uh, that you have to have suffered discrimination, that you have to look like you're a member of the classification, that you have to be culturally affiliated with the classification, except to some extent for American Indians, you basically just have to meet the legal criteria. So you wind up with a situation where programs that were meant primarily to help African Americans, like government contracting programs, wind up helping uh, a wealthy Indian immigrant from Bangalore who studied the uh, for his MBA at Stanford and now is starting a business or someone like, you know, if the Mexican ambassador to the U.S.'s son decides to stay in the United States and uh, apply to college, he gets that benefit. And you do have this additional complication that you mentioned. Uh, this was a real surprise to me. Uh, if you had asked me what percentage of African-Americans were born abroad, uh, I would have said less than 5%, but it turns out that it's about 11%, and another 10% are second generation, and they tend to be more economically and educationally successful than African-Americans who've been in the country, whose families have been in the country longer. So you go to places like Harvard, and two-thirds of the students who are admitted as African-Americans and are benefiting from uh, affirmative action are first or second generation immigrants or have one white parent, mostly the immigrants. And you have this real irony where I think a lot of us, a lot of people believe we should be um, giving a break to those who are descendants of American slaves, but some of the people getting the benefit are not only not, to, they're black, but they're not only not descendants of American slaves, they may have been the people who sold the slaves to the slave traders uh, uh, 200 years ago. Uh, indeed, you know, well, uh, well intentioned, of course, but of course, it's become uh, horribly distorted. Now, we've focused our conversation on, on benefits that, that are conferred on people who are designated um, uh, minorities, but you made an allusion to the fact that there are also some minorities that, by virtue of their minority status, may actually suffer discrimination against, le legal discrimination against, uh, and to bring us upon current events. As you know, that there's a case before the Supreme Court that, that does. Uh, uh, involve our uh, beloved local institution, Harvard, the Students for Fair Admission versus Harvard, actually um, uh, wants to defend, again, using the principles in the earlier Baki case that said, okay, look, we can consider race when doing admissions. And again, what's come to light in the, uh, in, uh, in the trial itself is that um, if one is, let's say, an Asian minority, one has to have substantially higher uh, test results and, and qualifications to get admission um, you know, let's say a, a, a white American is sort of neutral and, and, and a black um, applicant is given an advantage. Um, is it your view that, you know, using race and, and the, what we've covered is the, the vagaries of, of defining that term, it, it, is that, let's say, objectively unfair to, let's say, give one weight to more weight to one race, less weight to another, given that there seems to be no correlation between race and past oppression, at least, you know, at its face? Well, I mean, first of all, we should be cognizant of the fact that the Supreme Court has only allowed race and university admissions for diversity purposes. And if they were truly interested in diversity, uh, other than mere aesthetic diversity, we're going to have people of different skin tones and appearances on the cover of the alumni magazine and so forth, the admissions materials. It doesn't make any sense to include all Asian Americans constituting people descended from 65% of the world's population as one diversity classification. Uh, there was a big case at, before the current case against Harvard, there was a big case at the University of Texas where they were essentially in practice preferring uh, Hispanic applicants uh, and downgrading Asian American applicants. And the example I give, well, let's say you're a 
member of the Hamang Cambodian minority from Minnesota, and you go to the University of Texas and you say, I, I you know, I'd like to apply, they say, well, you're subtracting from diversity because you'd be another Asian. Uh, we want to add to diversity by having another Hispanic. That person of Hamang ancestry could say, you know, University of Texas, to my knowledge, has never had a single Hmong person ever, that would really add diversity. You already have 2,000 Mexican-Americans. How is it adding to diversity to take the 2,001st Mexican-American as opposed to the first Hmong? So again, we have these crude, quite, not even really racial classifications. They're uh, legally speaking racial classifications, but they're arbitrary. They don't even follow what we normally think of as racial lines. And the Mexican-Americans themselves, uh, you could just be, you could be someone uh, who is a descendant of a Mexican farm worker uh, who is mostly of indigenous origin, but you could also be someone whose ancestors were Spanish conquistadors and have been living in Texas since the 6th, 17th century, and you're 100% European in origin and as American as as you could get, and you get exactly the same preference as a Hispanic. So it really is. So even if you think that there's some level of equity or fairness to preferring historically disadvantaged racial groups and admissions, this ain't it. So given that, we we all want to ensure that the people who are truly disadvantaged do have some benefit, and we don't want to dilute that concept by making essentially everybody disadvantaged or everybody a minority. How do we tease out the concept of, of disadvantaged citizens from the concept of race? I think in your, your, uh, your book, you use a, 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 a term I think I've heard for the first time from you, separating out race and state. How do we do that and, 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 and do it with the, the precisions that, that's needed to ensure that well-intentioned effort to help disadvantaged people aren't, aren't directed towards effectively a, a Benetton commercial of kids from elite prep schools from around the, uh, the, the country? Yes. I mean, so first of all, we obviously have a lot of programs that help disadvantaged people that aren't race-based. I mean, I don't know what the figure is now. Hundreds of billions of dollars are being spent on Medicaid. Uh, it goes more to people of traditional underrepresented minority groups because they tend to be those categories overall are poorer than Americans as a whole, but we don't base it on race at all. So there's that. But also, if we want to separate <laughs> race and state, there may in some cases uh, be not quite proxies for race, but things that correlate with race, but aren't actually racial classifications. So we already have a situation where the Supreme Court has said that membership in an American Indian tribe is not a racial classification, even though it correlates with race. Not everyone who's a member of an American Indian tribe is actually of racial Indian descent because it's possible to get in otherwise, but also a lot of people who have some racial Indian background are in members of tribes. Uh, and it's a political category based on the historical relationship the US government has had with the Indian tribes. One could argue, for example, for narrow preferences for descendants of American slaves on a similar grounds. This is a historical political classification based on disadvantages that this group has faced going back to the constitution itself. That it's again, while um, almost everyone who will fall into the category of descendants of slaves is black, at least 20 or so percent of the population that's black are not descendants of American slaves. So I'm not sure how the Supreme Court would feel about that. Justice Kavanaugh actually asked this precise question uh, at oral arguments so it's on their minds. But you could you could have certain categories like that. You could even make it narrower, like, oh, we're going to prefer people who live in segregated <laughs> school districts where uh, minority populations are, you know, more than 80% of the school, and then say, because this is an example of concentrated poverty based on past racism, but not everyone who happens to be a member of uh, this um, phenotype uh, gets the benefit. So there are, there maybe are some ways around it, but again, the most basic answer is that if minority certain minority groups are disproportionately disadvantaged to begin with any race neutral program that helps the disadvantage will still disproportionately help them indeed so but if we do say again we, we define their disadvantage as disadvantage uh demonstrate disadvantage rather than a broad brush of, of race would we ultimately let's say in a brave new world uh, i'll categorize this as a if you were king for a day or all nine judges uh, justices for once could we literally ban the use of race you know, in its purest sense from the law uh, on constitutional grounds? Were we to, in, in, then, in a sense, divorce race and disadvantage and more precisely define disadvantage and ultimately say the ra race becomes irrelevant in, in the eyes of the law? Uh, so they do that in France, uh, more, more or less, and it can be done. I mean, the real difficulty is that there are certain 
anti-discrimination laws, in particular the Voting Rights Act, that would be extremely hard to enforce or even monitor unless the government kept track of people's race. How would you know if some local district in a uh, rural district in Texas is suppressing the Hispanic, the Mexican American vote if you didn't have some idea whether Mexican Americans were voting or not. Uh, and I don't think the United States is quite prepared to dispense with its anti-discrimination laws or statistical evidence of discrimination quite yet. So I think preference, some sort of racial classification is going to be with us for a certain amount of time. Uh, but, uh, and you know, you don't want a situation where the FBI can't track hate crimes because we don't look at race. Uh, but we can certainly limit, to, I mean, my, I don't really talk about this in classified, but if I had to rewrite the book, I would say towards the end, uh, I do say that we should try to separate race and state, that we should, when we do use classifications, we should use them as narrowly as possible in the way that to achieve the whatever limited goal we're trying to achieve. But I think the other thing I'd say is that a proper legal standard is before we classify anybody by race, racial classifications are supposed to be subject to strict scrutiny, which means the government has to have a compelling interest. So before the government asks you to check the box and start gathering data and all that, and therefore it's classifying you by race, they should have to show to the courts that there's a compelling government interest in doing so. They're not just doing so for administrative convenience or because they're used to doing it, or because interest groups want them to. Uh, for, and I think, for example, in the medical context, it would clearly fail because if anything, using crude, non-racial, non-genetic categories that have to correlate with our racial classification scheme, if anything, undermines good medical practice rather than promotes it. Yeah, indeed, I think, and in some way, we've come full circle to where we where we started, which is um, we have to acknowledge, despite past um, discrimination, there certainly is uh, current discrimination. Meaning, one could be. Uh, affluent, but but black and 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 be discriminated against, or Hispanic visually, you know, appearance wise, and be discriminated against. And we still need to have ways to measure whether that's happening, uh, you know, in, in broader society, right? Independent of past grievance, current discrimination based on appearance still exists clearly. Sure, and you know, but I think we do ultimately have a conflict of visions. Uh, there are those who think that. America is so intrinsically racist, it's so baked into the American pie, so to speak, that we'll never get rid of uh, race-based differences. And we should in, we should both encapsulate them in law and freeze them the way they are right now, uh, even though the government itself is partly responsible for how we perceive of race, and just make sure each group gets its fair share, because otherwise we're not going to have anything remotely resembling equity. My own view is that the historical levels of assimilation we've seen for previously uh, contest, very contested identities like Catholics who used to be excluded from all sorts of things. People thought a Catholic can never become president. Now you have a Catholic president, six Catholic Supreme Court justices, and just what's going on at the grassroots with very high rates of interracial marriage. You see, you walk around any major city or even small towns, you see every possible combination of people uh, as boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, that we are at a point where we could imagine a multi-racial, multi-ethnic American identity uh, that people still may still have, you know, um, kiss me, I'm Irish uh, stickers on uh, St. Patrick's Day, but no one really cares anymore so much if you're Irish, and that we could imagine race being the same way 50 years from now, but if the government in on classifying people and then divvying up benefits uh, by race, which will in turn encourage people to organize themselves politically, socially, and otherwise by race, they're really going to impede uh, the progress we might make towards that and leave us with permanent racial divisions. Indeed, there's a, a feedback loop. So we're getting uh, close to the end of our time together. Um, if we're talking about, I think you're quoting Thomas Sowell there, this conflict of vision, and we say, okay, um, do we imagine that the uh, classification of race has the effect of having us def define ourselves by this, this arbitrary notion of race and therefore reinforce these boundaries. Do you see a, a future whereby we do sort of um, identify as white instead of American? Um, you, 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 or do you see us um, migrating towards the other vision, which is race essentialism, uh, which says, okay, look, uh, there's, you know, impossible, uh, intractable divide between races, that conflict will always exist. And, um, and uh, this is this is our this is our lot forever. Which which do you think do you envision? 
Uh, I mean, my own preference is the post, you know, what you might call post-racial vision and people mistake this doesn't mean a post-racial vision doesn't mean that no one ever notices that someone's a different color or looks different or no one has that. Oh, I'm proud of my African-American heritage. It just means that the way, you know, 50 years ago, if I was giving a speech about this sort of thing, or, or certainly 70 years ago, people would have noticed that I'm white, but they would have really said, you know, Jewish guy named Bernstein, looks Jewish, you know, whatever. And, but now, you know, most people don't care about that. We're all, we, we're, we've all, we've gone beyond that sort of ethnic difference. And we could have the same thing with regard to race. Like, yeah, you might, if you think about it, yes, this person may have been Hispanic, but publicly speaking, it doesn't matter. But there are entrenched interests who don't want that to happen. Uh, there are, are a group of um, left-leaning intellectuals who think the only way to create equity in the United States is for whites to become more white, to identify more and more with their whiteness so that they recognize their privilege and then use that knowledge to become anti-racist activists, which I just think is nuts because, you know, psychologically humans grew up in small tribes where you're in the in-group or in the out-group. And the in-group is what you depend on for survival and the out-group is your enemy. And historically speaking, psychologically speaking, the social science data uh, backs this up. The more you are likely to think of yourself as being white and the other people as being other, the more likely you want to screw over the other, not to help them. There might obviously going to be exceptions to that, but that's going to be the way they go. The other problem is that government, corporations, big business are used to the current system and they like it. And then we have a whole group of people who make their living off of this. I was just looking at uh, Latino studies departments in the United States, right? These are all people who have jobs based on the notion there is such a thing as Latino identity that could be studied. And uh, not only do they have jobs doing this, if you look at it, you know, 80% of them are indistinguishable by looks, 80% of the professors from Europeans. And if you say, okay, being, you know, you're just really a white person who happens to have some Spanish heritage, uh, maybe a little bit of mix, it doesn't really make you any different from other immigrants. Where's their job now? Where's their career going to go? So uh, there, you know, I think there has to be a conscious effort uh, by those of us who have a post-racial vision to combat the entrenched groups who want to keep the status quo. Indeed, you have a quotation in your book uh, from Antonin Scalia um, about uh, there is, uh, I, I'm, I'm sure I'll butcher it, but there, you know, there aren't races in the Constitution, it's just the American race. Uh, I, I don't know if I've given a fair uh, shake Close to that. Close enough. Close enough. So, uh, so there are others who share that vision. I, I, I will admit, I, I also share that vision. Again, being of an Italian-American descent, I, I think the... Um, the interpretation we had is uh, Italians became white after Mickey Mantle or oh, after Joe DiMaggio. Uh, so I don't, I don't know when that happened, but uh, it <laughs> happened. Uh, uh, and I, I see that as, as progress. So uh, this has been a really great conversation. I appreciate your time, uh, uh, Professor Bernstein. And it's, it's really um, uh, an important issue. I, I recommend your book. Please, for our listeners, uh, share with us, where can we learn more about um, your book and your earlier work and, and your writing uh, on these topics? So uh, the book is available. It's classified, The Untold Story of Racial Classification in America. You can buy on Amazon or I suppose at fine bookstores everywhere, as they say. Um, uh, my, If you click on that link, there's you know my author name there. You click on my author name, it shows my other books. Uh, if you're interested in my, if you're a more academic type, want to read the, you know, the articles as opposed to books, uh, you could, if you look at ssrn.com, which has basically all the articles I've ever written, you could download those uh, at your uh, leisure. And I also blog among with along, along with a bunch of other law professors at volok, V-O-L-O-K-H.com. Wonderful. Well, thank you for joining me today on Hubwonk, Professor Bernstein. Thank you so much. This has been another episode of Hubwonk. If you enjoyed today's show, there are several ways to support Hubwonk and Pioneer Institute. It would be easier for you and better for us if you subscribe to Hubwonk on your iTunes podcatcher. It would make it easier for others to find us if you offer a five-star rating or a favorable review. We're always grateful if you share Hubwonk with friends. If you have ideas or comments or suggestions for me about future episode topics, you're welcome to email me at hubwonk at pioneerinstitute.org. Please join me next week for a new episode of Hubwonk.